Bob Springer, Chair of the Committee. Uh, Mrs. Hunter. Present. Mr. Jeffries. Don Jeffries, present. And staff that are on the call include Kate O'Brien, Mona DeSulio, uh, Janet Claypool, Dave Sullivan, Kathy LaPlante. Um, so um, I don't think we have anticipated speakers on the agenda, so I'm going to move to citizens' comments. Kate, do we have any citizens' comments? Do not. Okay. Um, then I'm going to go to something that I that um, I've anticipated all day with great pleasure. Um, and so. Mr. Faulkner, you don't have to stand up. You don't have to give a valedictorian speech. You just need to attend. Make it easy on you. So, Town of Dover, a resolution. Whereas Henry Faulkner on June 29th, 1920 has completed 27 years of service as a member of the Town of Dover Planning Board. And whereas Henry Faulkner has served on the planning board in each of the last five decades, with his first term from 1989 to 1995, and then serving again from 2000 to 2020. And whereas in addition to his service on the planning board, Henry Faulkner has been the board's liaison to the Conservation Commission and the Open Space Committee, and is a trustee of the Dover Land Conservation Trust and whereas Henry Faulkner has demonstrated the steady commitment and honorable dedication to fulfilling his duties to ensure that changes proposed to the community were done in an orderly and thoughtful manner. And therefore, be it resolved that the Board of Selectmen publicly recognizes, commends, and extends our deep gratitude to Henry Faulkner for his extraordinary service and devotion to the town of Dover. Thank you very, very much. Henry, um, I, I thank you for your dedication and your willingness to spend that amount of time working with Mark Sarrow. You know, <laughs> I just don't know how that could possibly happen. Your, your generosity with your time is beyond commendable. It's just simply mind boggling. Thank you, thank you, thank you. John? Well said, Robert. Henry, very well done. You, it, you are, you, you're sort of, you are the person that everybody would look up to and say, I want to be like Henry. You have service above self in everything you do. You are a generous, kind, thoughtful person. And I'm just, it's just a pleasure to have been able to serve with you in the limited capacity that we have. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. Robin? Henry, I don't know what else to say other than thank you. Um, very impressive, the number of years service. Um, it's something for me to try and achieve. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a newbie compared to you. I've only been involved in town government for about 14 years now. So really thank you for everything you've done for the town. You've served tirelessly and really do appreciate it. Mr. Saro, would you like to speak? Uh, yeah, sure, absolutely. I, I can't add much to what you've already said about Henry, except that it has been a real privilege as we told him at our last planning board meeting to have served with Henry all these years. I, I had the privilege of coming onto the board at a time when, uh, when Henry and a number of other experienced board members were there and uh, they have all moved on and Henry is the one person who's still there um, bringing a lot of institutional knowledge to the board. And uh, he's not only really valuable there uh, on the planning board, but uh, has been just a, a real model of the principles that the planning board always tries to put in place for the town and the spirit that we try to bring to what we do. And so he's really walked the walk and uh, just been a, a real honor to serve on that board with Henry. Thank you, Mark. Carol, you. would you like to say anything? 
Y ahí. Carol. Which Carol? Carol Sherico. You, Carol. Um, yeah, I, I certainly echo everything that Mark said. Um, it's been an honor and just an incredible learning experience to serve with Henry. I'm glad that my time overlapped with his. Um, we will miss his knowledge and his institutional mm -hmm. memory, um, but he has promised me, I don't know if this is really true, but he said <laughs> that I can call him anytime <laughs> if you've got a question or need to, need to call on um, his history of the development of the town, but we will miss him. Thank you, Henry. You're very welcome. And I did meet it. I'm going to say the <laughs> last word for Carol Lisbon. Sorry for that. Okay. Sorry. Uh, can you hear me? Yep. Okay, great. Sorry. So um, there's not, nothing more to say than what Carol and Mark and, and Bob and you, and you have said. Um, it's been a pleasure. I've known Henry for 35 years or so, and he is... Um, a joy to work with and his knowledge is going to be sorely, sorely missed. Um, I would note that at our last planning board meeting, um, we did also, um, in addition to the proclamation that you read tonight, we also read a proclamation from um, Denise Garlick and the uh, Massachusetts um, House of Representatives thanking Henry for his decades of service. So thank you, Henry. Thank you, Carol. Well, thank you all. So, Henry, what are your plans now that you have all this free time? <laughs> uh, I seem to be, keep plenty busy, <laughs> uh, even without planning board. But well, that's good. I do mean it. I'm, ar I'm around, so if you need to consult me, anybody, please do. Thank you for your generosity again, and I'm sure we will. All right, thank you. And, this is um, this is a great honor, I must say. I was dumbfounded when this the, the planning board meeting, <laughs> and I'm still very very honored. Well deserved. Well deserved. Thank you again. All right, I um, with that I'm going to um, move on to the next item on our agenda. Um, and that is an update from Colonial. Um, gentlemen, you want to um, provide the update? Uh, sure, sure, thank you. Um, as you know, the boil order was lifted uh, on Thursday, uh, July 2nd. Um, that was the result of us uh, working with the DEP and we were able to, uh, you know, through um, you know, through the, the chlorine treatment that we're doing now, the chlorination, um, we were able to uh, provide enough where uh, we were uh, meeting what's called a four log uh, disinfection or inactivation, uh, which allowed us to lift the boil order. And, uh, you know, at that point, you know, at, at that point, everyone could start, you know, using the water again. Um, prior to that, we uh, we continued to pass out water right up until the boil, boil order was lifted. Uh, and now we have uh, demobilized that effort. Um, going forward, uh, we are going to be pursuing uh, the permanent four log uh, disinfection at the Francis Street facility. And uh, we'll be working with the DEP on that uh, with, uh, with the permitting prior to going to construction. Okay, thank you. Is, Eric, is, is that you on the, on the um, screen? It is. It is. Would you like to um, add? Uh, sure. I, I mean, again, I think um, when it became clear while the board order proceeded that we were not going to be able to resolve the issue just by uh, disinfecting the wells and flushing the system, um, we shifted gears, um, particularly because we couldn't identify what the source of the contamination was, which is contemplated by the groundwater rule to require a four log treatment. So um, to Colonial's credit, in fairly short, a short period of time, they were able to hook up a chlorine analyzer, patch it into their SCADA system, so all the appropriate safety guards were in place. 
um, and demonstrated that they were able to meet that four log requirement, which um, that's important because in addition to just trying to get rid of bacteria, you also have to be concerned about viruses. And that's why the groundwater rule went into effect. Because if you're not meeting that four log requirement, even if you are chlorinating, you may kill the bacteria, but you're not killing viruses. Um, and that's obviously very important. And I know some folks have raised the issue of why uh, can't they simply install UV treatment rather than chlorination? Um, and I think there are a couple of reasons for that. One, from a, from a health standpoint, uh, UV is very effective at treating protozoans like cryptosporidium and giardia, which you see in surface waters, not in groundwaters. Um, it is effective in killing bacteria, but it is very ineffective in killing viruses. So it's not really an option um, from a public health standpoint and from a regulatory standpoint, um, I'm not aware of any system that's used UV treatment to meet poor log. Um, the cost of that would be prohibitive. Okay, thank you. I, um, the, the retraction of the, of the boil order was welcomed at my house. I can tell you that. <laughs> um, and, Mine as well. <laughs> yeah. and, and life has been better <laughs> uh, since that has happened. And I know you guys at Colonial have done uh, a lot of work. Um, this, was, this went on longer than anyone probably thought it would. Um, I visited the, your, your folks at the uh, highway department a number of times, and they were just excellent. Um, I greatly appreciate the, uh, the work you did to improve the communications with the residents. Uh, I think that really went a long way. Um, and so, you know, sometimes good things come out of challenges. Um, and and uh, right now, I hope everyone is feeling a little bit more relaxed. I have um, really two questions um, that I would that I that I'm going to posit, um, and and you know one is the, one of them that I get at home, um, and it's like okay so we did this and you know we've got we looked at the boil order but how do we know the water this contamination won't happen again? So I um, is there uh, additional testing that takes place? Or how, how, how do we help to uh, assure citizens that we're consistently on top of this and looking actively to prevent um, this uh, contamination to occur again? And I'll open it up to either you guys, uh, uh, Eric, or to the guys at Colonial. Uh, well, I'll, I'll start, and then uh, Colonial can certainly augment my response. But um, the reality is, is that um, there is a source of contamination out there that's impacting these wells. It may not be identified, but the benefit of having four log treatment is regardless of whether that contamination is present in the wells or not, the combination of the chlorine dosage rate and the amount of time that that water is um, in contact with that chlorination before it hits the first user, it's a the fairly simple calculation um, assures you that it will uh, kill any bacteria or viruses um, on an ongoing basis. It's continuously analyzed with the chlorine analyzer, which is tied into the SCADA system at the treatment facility. So if for some reason that chlorine dosage rate should drop for any reason or the pump rates of the wells should change, there are automatic alarms built into the system that would notify Colonial immediately and they could respond and make any adjustments that are necessary. So it's really just knowing that you have that continuous chlorination and that treatment that's occurring um, that ensures you that there's not gonna be an impact of the system. And of course, that's also bolstered um, by their uh, monthly bacteria sampling as well, which would be done. Okay, uh, Nick or, or Bob or anyone else? Um, yeah, just to add on to that, um, you know, as Eric mentioned, it you know it will will deactivate any you know any uh, bacteria or viruses, um, and you know just as far as uh, the chlorine analyzer and our chlorination system, um, you know what it is with the four log treatment. There's a minimum there's a minimum chlorine level in the water that you have to maintain. Um, so we even uh, we even 
shoot for a, a dosage a little higher than that, just as a factor of safety. If there is a drop in, you know, for instance, there is, there is a drop in the dosage where, or a change in the system that would cause an alarm to go off. Uh, we do we do have that that safety buffer in there that um, you know that will assure uh, that the level doesn't drop too fast in the system if, if there is an alarm that goes off. Thank you. Um, John, do you have a, any follow-up questions? Yes, please. Thanks, Bob. And, and gentlemen, John Jeffries from the Board of Selectmen tonight. I know we've spoke before, but could you just identify yourselves for the um, folks who are going to watch us on on Facebook or, or the, the streaming portion of it, just when you are answering the questions, and uh, Eric or the folks at Colonial Water, will you just identify yourself either as from MassDEP or from Colonial? So the viewers who are seeing you for the first time will just know who you are. So um, and to thank you for the for the update and Bob, thanks for the for the questions. Uh, my two follow ups are: you called the system permanent disinfection process, and the the as the process is is in place. Does the system also notify call warning at the town level in the event that the alarm goes off? That's question number one. And then question number two is you, you mentioned both, both of you mentioned the chlorination process is gonna be permanent. And a lot of the constituents have called and asked us about the smell, the noticeable smell of chlorine in the water. And could you speak a little bit to that, whether it's the process of chlorination is is sodium chloride or, or the, the actual process, there's just been concerns or questions, right? I shouldn't say concerns, but questions about the, the noticeable smell. It's for some people is much more present than for others. And is there a way to diminish that by running the water or by flushing it? And those are my, uh, those are my two follow-ups. Thank you. And this is Bob Gallo Colonial. Um, you know, to your first question uh, with Carl Warnick, uh, he would not receive the SCADA alarm messages. Uh, that's something that our operators, um, our operators would receive. And if there was an issue that were to, um, you know, require us to notify Carl, we would do so by telephone or, you know, that's, that's typically the best way, I think, to reach him. Um, but as far as the, the alarms go, you know, the SCADA alarms, um, are built into all of our facilities, uh, or you know, uh, you know where Francis is being worked on now. Um, so we we would receive uh, those messages from any facility within town that we have, any pump station. Um, but as far as contacting Carl, we would do so, uh, you know, by telephone if if the need arise, you know, did arise. Um, if it's a, you know, if it's just a simple you know, alarm where the dosage has to be reset, uh, you know, and the, and the alarm reset, then that's not something we would typically, um, you know, call Carl about. Um, so that's, you know, that's just an operational, uh, an operational thing uh, in that, re that respect. Um, to your comment about chlorination, um, at this point, uh, the four log system is an interim system um, using you know, basically using the pipe volumes that we have out there. Uh, so that is one of the reasons, you know, we do have a chlorine residual that is a little higher than what we would typically run at for the permanent system. Um, it's still well within, it's still well within the parameters or the limitations uh, you know, that the mass DEP has for chlorine residuals. Um, so going forward, what's going to happen is uh, we're we are going to make some modifications to the system, and just to kind of put it, uh, you know, put it simply, we're going to add more volume uh, before it reaches Francis Street. And what that will allow us to do under the permitting condition is to reduce our chlorine residual level, or the amount of, you know, or you know, the amount of chlorine we're putting into the system as a total. Um, so at this point, um, it's a little higher than we would typically run the system well within regulations and once we go to permanent you know permanent a four log treatment we can expect that that chlorine level to drop by about half under our under our permanent treatment program eric do you have anything to add to that no um i i can't seem to get the lighting 
right? It looks like I'm in the witness protection program here, so I apologize. But um, uh, I mean, to I think what the order required when we, as part of lifting the boil order, was in addition to them providing their level two assessment, trying to identify what the cause was, which is due to us by this Friday. Uh, by July 15th, they also have to give us a plan and a schedule for the permanent four log disinfection. And that's where um, we'll be reviewing, um, you know, what those revised calculations would look like. I do agree with Colonial's assessment that if you can put a larger diameter pipe in than the one that's currently in place before it hits Francis Street, you're increasing your storage volume, which you can cut back on your chlorine dosage rate, which makes perfect sense. Thank you. Robin? So a lot of my questions were answered based upon this um, discussion that occurred. Uh, so just to make sure that I understand, before the permanent system goes into place, you will continue to run the temporary system that's in place today. Is that correct? Uh, yes, this is Bob at Colonial again. That is correct. And uh, as Eric mentioned earlier, we do have uh, the analyzers and the alarms set up at this point. Um, so it, it's basically operating like it will in the permanent condition, um, with the difference being that we're going to change some pipe diameters and uh, lower the chlorine dosage. Yeah, and I would just add um, they're required to under the terms of the order that we issued to them. Okay. And then my, my next question is, how often will you continue to test the water? Will you, are you going back immediately to monthly testing or will there be a more frequent basis by, on, by which you test the water? Well, what we're going to do is, um, I think we, you know, we, we can go back to monthly testing, but one thing we are going to do is regularly check the chlorine residuals throughout the system. Um, that's kind of a quick check to see if we have, you know, the appropriate amount of disinfection out there. Uh, you know, that is something we're going to, you know, institute as part of our standard operating procedure. One, you know, now that we have this four log treatment in place. So, if you do have an acceptable residual out there, uh, then um, you know, the, the water will be safe to drink. All right. So, but to summarize, um, your initial plan will go to the DEP by Friday, and then by July 15th, there's a, a permanent plan that gets issued to the DP. Did I get that right? Yeah, so there, I'll handle that if you guys okay. mind. Um, so uh, this is Eric Worrell from DEP. So the order requires by July 10th that they submit what's known as a level two assessment. Um, a similar assessment, that's required under the total coliform rule. There's also a similar assessment that's required under the groundwater rule, but for purposes of this um, situation, we're kind of consolidating them into one submittal, which will come is due to us by this Friday. Okay. Um, the follow-up um, submittal required by July 15th is uh, a plan for permanent four log disinfection. So as, okay. as if this hadn't happened, but they were coming into the department through the normal permitting process. Okay. Uh, so now I have a couple of questions that have been circulating in the chat room that I would like to ask if that's okay, Mr. Chairman. It is absolutely okay. Mr. Chairman. Um, so one of the questions, and I think you have answered this, but there may be a miscommunication. So if Colonial, if you could just um, let the Dover citizens know how you, what your plans are to reimburse customers for the extra expenses. And then there was a second part of this question is will, how will you reimburse customers for the excess water that they use to flush their pipes? Sure, uh, this is Nick Chance with Colonial Water. Um, so as far as the reimbursement goes, uh, we, we did talk about this at the last meeting, but I can uh, certainly summarize it again. Um, it's, it's really in four separate parts. Uh, first of which is, uh, if you have made water purchases on your own, uh, to please re uh, send those receipts into us and we can go ahead and uh, get those reimbursements taken care of for you uh, for any water purchases that have been made during the boil order. Uh, secondly is based off of actual consumption. So we utilize um, 
the uh, mass DEP target of 65 gallons per day uh, per capita. And then we utilize uh, uh, basically a median, a median household estimate of three and a half people per household um, uh, to come up with the daily amount of water that would be reimbursed. And then we multiplied that by the number of days of the boil order, which was 22 days, it was in effect, or 21 days it was in effect uh, by the actual rate of water. So that's part one or part two of uh, reimbursement. Secondly would be, uh, thirdly would be the actual base fee or the service charge itself is if I uh, am recalling correctly, it's 51.90 or 52.90 per month. Uh, so we divide that by 30, multiply that by 22, and that will be uh, another uh, credit for reimbursement. And then lastly will be an inconvenience uh, credit that we will do uh, $20 over the course of three billing cycles, uh, again, for inconvenience or for any additional purchases that were made during uh, this time. Um, and uh, the reimbursements are, we have to line them up with our billing periods. And I hope that that doesn't cause more confusion, but uh, we do have to line up with the billing period. So the first billing period ended uh, June 16th, which would have been six days the boil order was in, was in effect. So if anybody is receiving uh, bills uh, via the internet from us, you would have seen on your bill um, that went out on Monday, uh, the first credit that came through. And if you're if you're receiving paper bills, and you'll see that you'll see that first credit on your invoice when you receive that paper bill, uh, probably at the end of this week, um, you'll see that second credit will come through for the final billing period, which will be six seventeen uh, through seven two when the boil order was lifted, and then in the August billing there will be one final twenty dollar uh, inconvenience uh, credit that'll be issued. This is also, this whole, this explanation is also on the website uh, under the news section. And there's a hyperlink for the uh, reimbursement worksheet as we're calling it. Okay, hey, thank you. No problem. Uh, it, and there's a second question, which I'm not sure if either you or, or the DEP should answer. And that is, is there any cumulative risk of continued use of chlorine in our water? As, as far as, no, go ahead, Bob. Yeah, as far as continued risk, um, you know, at the levels we'll be treating, we're, uh, you know, we're well within uh, both the EPA and the Mass DEP um, guidelines um, for chlorination. Uh, you know, like I said, we're actually going to be under our permanent, uh, you know, just kind of give you a, you know, a technical um, version here, under the permanent. Um, for log disinfection, we're probably going to be around 0.6 to 0.65, you know, milligrams per liter. Uh, the, the EPA and DEP annual average limit is actually four milligrams per liter. So, so we're going to be we're going to be you know pretty far down there as far as uh, dosage goes, uh, and um, you know as far as long term health effects, you know those have been evaluated by the EPA, and that's you know that's where they dictate those levels to us. Thank you. Eric, anything to add? No, I agree with what Bob just said. Um, the levels that they're chlorinating at are um, within the realm of what other systems in Massachusetts chlorinate at as well, and well below any levels of concern. And when EPA establishes uh, health standards, they go through pretty detailed um, um, toxicological research to come up with what those safe numbers are. They're not just making it up. It's based on actual scientific research. And then there's, then there's another question, and Eric, you may be best equipped to answer this. It, okay. it is from a citizen who said that uh, the use of UV radiation needs to be combined with ozone treatment in order to address both the bacterial and bacteria and viruses. The system in Boston and the MWRA uses a combination of ozone and UV radiation as their major disinfectants. So I guess, this person was wondering if a system similar to what the MWRE uses could be used for the colonial system. Uh, for a system this size, no. 
Um, MWA has a filtration waiver from, uh, from EPA. So uh, it's a little bit different. It's a surface water source. It's the Bobbin Reservoir. Um, but they do a combination of chloramination um, which they use because it maintains the residual in the system much longer than chlorination. And then they do the UV treatment to deal with the uh, protozoa that would be in the reservoir at all times in the surface water. Hmm. And then the ozonation is, um, is just another step in their treatment process. But it, it's, kind of, it's kind of apples and oranges. You couldn't really duplicate what MWA does with the number of communities and people that they serve in a, in a, si in a facility this size. It wouldn't be practical. Thank you. And then the last question that I have I, is for Colonial and a resident is wondering if your local operators are certified. Yes, we have a primary operator. This is Bob Galligan uh, for Colonial. We have a primary operator on site and we do have uh, other operators that do assist with the system. Uh, we have operator technicians that are in the, in the, you know, that train under the primary operator. They're in the process um of gaining licensure um so you know it, it is it is a system that allows for um the technicians to train under a licensed operator so that they can gain experience and take the next test you know the next level of certification yeah and just to put a, a finer point on that so all public water systems are ranked by their size and required to have certified operators of the appropriate grade managing those systems um, and that is done through the, the Division of Professional Licensure in Massachusetts. Thank you. Those are all the questions, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, Robin. Colonial, do you have anything else to add? Well, I, I think we would just like to say, you know, you know although it's, it's a very unfortunate incident that happened, um, you know, we, we are in the process of, uh, as, you, as you have mentioned before, Mr. Chairman, that um, we've improved our communication, and now that we have a, you know, a fuller database of contacts for people, um, we will continue um, to provide a, a periodic updates of what we're what we're doing with the system, um, just in an effort to, uh, you know, to better better communicate with with the with the citizens. Um, you know, we are grateful that, you know, we were able to get through this, uh, you know, this boil order, and we do thank. Uh, the residents of Dover, um, you know, while we were out there delivering water, we really had, you know, obviously a great number of people show up. And I would say that uh, they were, for the most part, were very understanding of the situation uh, and supportive. So, uh, again, we'd like to thank the citizens of Dover for that. So and, and I have one last thing, Mr. Chairman, and <laughs> Colonial, you can tell me if I'm correct or not. You have arranged for recycling of the water of the water bottles at the town highway garage, correct? And the recycle bin will be there until Friday. Uh, so yeah, so the recycle bin is on site. Uh, this is Nicola Chance again, Colonial Water. Uh, recycle bin is on site. It is right near where that water tanker was previously located. Um, we are asking if you if, if you're able to, if you're physically able to, if you can please crush those bottles before you put them into the container so we make sure we have enough room. And the container will be picked up on Monday. So it'll be there through the weekend. Thank you very much. We do appreciate you doing this for us. No problem. So Robin and John, I, I, I would ask um, Colonial to make themselves available for our next meeting on the 23rd and, and we can get an update. Is that okay? I got a couple of nods. So, yes. Um, yes. That'd be great. Colonial, um, it would be great if you guys can can uh, you know zoom in on the on the twenty third and just tell us uh, how things have been going and and we can get updated at that point. Is that acceptable? Yeah. Yes. Most certainly. Okay. Well, thank you very much, guys. Really, really appreciate it, Eric. I don't know if you're still around because the screen. I am. Is but thank you for your participation and for your knowledge and wisdom. Uh, we, we greatly appreciate you joining us tonight. Okay, thank you, welcome. And uh, enjoy the weather. I think it's going to turn a little bit toward the weekend. I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> Good night. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Good night, guys. Thank you. Okay. Um, item uh, 1.3, which is a solar project presentation.
Kate and Beth. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have uh, Jessica Wall here from Anderson and Krieger and also Beth Greenblatt from Beacon Integrated Solutions. Um, and they're here to provide an update uh, for the solar project for the DPW building. Um, and I guess I'll hand it over to you guys and I'll bring up that presentation. Thank you, Kate. Hi, good evening. My name is Jessica Wall. I'm an environmental attorney with Anderson and Krieger at Town Council's office. Um, with me is Beth Greenblatt of Beacon Consulting. Um, Beth has been looking at some of the project financials um, and I should note, Beth, please feel free to, to jump in. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, members of the board for, for taking time on your uh, agenda tonight to allow us to provide an update. As Kate said, um, we wanted to provide just a quick update and then get some input from the board about a proposed solar project at the DPW building at Two Dedham Street. So we've submitted um, a, a memo. Uh, Beth has done a, an analysis of the financials. And then I also put together just some quick slides for visuals, uh, which Kate has brought up here. So I will, um, I guess, Kate, I'll just let you know when we need to go to the next slide, but there, there are only a few of them. Sure. Um, so the project is, is a fairly straightforward roof solar project. It's meant to be occupying the full scope of the roof of the DPW building to offset the energy needs of that building. Um, and you'll see in, in the slide in front of you, this is from Select's presentation to the board a few months ago, just to give you an idea visually of what it would look like. Um, in most roof solar projects, uh, usually what you would want is uh, a, a roof that you think is not going to need any repairs within the next 20 years or so. A 20 year term is pretty standard within solar projects and that's what Select has proposed here. There's one slightly complicating factor about the roof in the DPW building, uh, which is that it's not clear, it's in good shape, but it's not clear that it wouldn't need any repairs within the next 20 years. And, and the reason that we're focused on the roof issue is because if the roof were to need repairs, it would require taking the solar installation off, moving it someplace else, putting it back on, sort of not usually what, what the parties would, would like to do. They try to avoid it. So we talked to Select about you know, trying to problem solve to see if we could work around this problem to, to continue forward with roof, uh, a rooftop project here on the DPW building. And Select came up with uh, a proposal that we wanted to bring forward to you all tonight and, and talk about some options. So Select has proposed that what they could do is work with a subcontractor to make roof improvements. It would almost look like a rubber coating. And I'll, I'll, the slide on that is, is slide number two, Kate, that would basically seal the top of the roof and make it uh, more stable or more resistant to needing repairs within the next 20 years. And the warranties for the roof would transfer to the town uh, for the term of the contract. Uh, and then that price of the roof work would be incorporated into the project pricing. So in other words, there wouldn't be uh, an outlay, an initial sort of cash outlay for the town uh, to do the work. The, the price of the roof work would get rolled into the rest of the energy pricing for the contract. So. Uh, Select went out and, and talked to some subcontractors about proposed price and that they got a quote back for $85,000 for the work. Um, and, and you can see on the, the slide here, just to give you an idea of what it is that they're doing, it's, it's sort of like a sealant on the top of the roof there. Um, Kate, I don't know if you want to go to the, the next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so just to give you an idea of the scope of, of what the work is, this is just the scope that they've provided. So it's a, a set of different steps. It's not just one quick spray. And then there's also the, the warranty price that is, is included within that $85,000. So we'd like to get some guidance and some feedback from the board this evening about how they'd like to proceed. Um, as I see it, there are two options. Um, and if there are other options that the board is, is thinking about, we're certainly all ears. One is uh, to proceed or as select has proposed to include the roof work in the project pricing going forward. Um, this means that there wouldn't be any upfront costs to the town, but there is a premium, uh, so to speak, associated with doing it this way. Because once you incorporate that pricing into the 20 year term of the contract, 
and including sort of financing and amortization. And Beth can, can speak to some of this analysis better than I can probably. There's a, ultimately the town will be paying about $163,000 over the 20 year term, as opposed to spending, you know, assuming it would be 85, 85 up front. So that's option one. Um, option two would be for the town to work with its own subcontractor uh, or work with its own contractor rather to pursue that work itself. And the cost there would be presumably cheaper um, to not have to pay that premium, but it would mean sort of an outlay from the town to be to find a pot of money that would work. Um, and then also there, if the town then proceeds with select later on to, to work on solar, there might be some pricing uh, implications some negative pricing implications, uh, which we can talk about in a second. So I'll stop there for one second. I, I know I have a, a little bit more to say, but I know that that's a lot of information. Um, are there initial questions so far? John? No, none, none, uh, none for me, Jess. The, um, I, I'll let you finish and, and I think the, uh, the questions that I have would be probably best suited for the end of the presentation. Okay. Sure. Okay, well, Great. Good. let's go ahead. Good, excellent. Um, so Beth um, has done a wonderful job looking at the financial implications of this in detail. Um, just background on the pricing, because I, I do think that ultimately this is a pricing issue and sort of a business decision for the board to consider. Uh, the Commonwealth's solar pricing program is broken down into blocks. And what it basically boils down to is that the earlier blocks, the, the lower block numbers, mean that you get better pricing on projects. So it incentivizes people coming into the market and projects coming online sooner. And each block has sort of a, a number, a, a size total number of projects that it can be accommodated, and then you move into a different block. So select needs to submit an application to the SMART program to, to know and to lock in which SMART block the project would be in. So Beth looked at uh, pricing under block four and block five, which select estimates would be the, the blocks that we would be in the project and looked at it with roof and without roof uh, sort of built in. Um, so Beth, I don't know, we, we have a slide with your, I think this is a summary of your analysis. Do you wanna walk through some of that a little bit? Sure. Thanks Jess and, and thank you folks for um, for uh, inviting me to this session. So as Jess mentioned, we looked at the pricing that Select proposed with and without this roof adder over blocks four and blocks five of the SMART program. And as Jess mentioned, the blocks really define how much revenue is afforded into the projects under the tariff. And the, the greater amount of revenue under the SMART program that the project gets obviously the, the greater amount of revenue that Select has to share with the town. So as you can see, their pricing in the first line, um, I provided just a summary of Select's PPA power purchase rate in, in blocks four and five. And as you can see in block four, it's 11.5 cents, block five, it's 12.3 cents. Um, once you layer on top of that, the capital cost which is not eligible for an investment tax credit, um, but would need to be financed over their 20 year term. Um, that 11.5 cent block four project with the roof grows to 14.4 cents each year for 20 years. So it's per kilowatt hour for 20 years. There's no escalator. And similarly for block five, the 12.3 cent starting price without the roof grows to 15. Point two cents um, per kilowatt hour for 20 years. Um, now in the report, which I think you folks um, also received um, that I had provided to the town, I, I provided some sort of general summary of some of the assumptions that we use to calculate our analysis. And just one point of reference that I think might be useful to understand, um, the avoided cost or the amount of energy that's actually, or the, the value of that energy that's consumed by the building that the solar array would offset is about 
14.7, I think it was 14.77 cents. And so if you look at the pricing on the first line with the roof, you're getting pretty close to, you know, in the, at 14.4 cents, their rate is still lower than actually what the savings you're seeing. So the savings are greater. Um, whereas it flips with in block five with the roof added. But with that being said, as Jess mentioned, this is a rubber membrane, a sprayable rubber membrane that's being added to the roof that has a 20 year life. So you're really avoiding replacing the roof in the, you know, for the next 20 years also. So that avoided cost of a roof replacement isn't embedded in this analysis, um, but it is a future avoided cost that you should um, you know, consider, of course. But as you can see in this analysis, um, looking at sort of the total costs of the project versus the total benefits, assuming that energy costs escalate, um, that those avoided costs escalate at 1% per year, um, you're looking at um, you know, savings to the town um, before the transaction costs, or let's say after. I've plugged in some just kind of transaction costs for consulting and legal to account for the need to make this project happen, but ranging anywhere from a high of about a little over $250,000. If it were, if we were able to qualify the project under block four without the roof to as low as a, a little under 60,000, if it qualifies under block five with the roof upgrade. So it's a pretty wide range. Um, and it's, it's simply a function of the, the value of the benefits versus the cost under the PPA and where you think energy pricing might go. Okay. Thank, thanks, Beth. I think that's, that's perfect. I know there's a, lot, there's a lot of detail and I'm sure folks might have um, questions as well on some of the finances. So, so the question that we've gotten from Select is you know, to keep the project moving forward in the SMART program um, we haven't obviously finalized any contracting documents yet. I think uh, that would take some time. But in the meantime, to give select, if the town wants to move forward, um, with enough sort of authorization to move forward with those smart program applications, they sent us a draft letter of intent, which basically is, is pretty bare bones, but it is like a, a little bit of a, a stopgap to let them keep developing the project and make site investigations and that sort of thing. So if, depending on what the board uh, wants to do, Select has asked for feedback from us or a response on the letter of intent. Um, so we're happy to talk further with the board about questions or, or follow-up items that they might have, um, but we wanted to bring all this information forward so that the board could make an informed decision. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm just going to, um, I mean, sort of my, there's an awful lot to digest. I read, I, I read the, um, the materials this afternoon. Um, um, this is not really an area of expertise. Fortunately, I have two, two co-members of the board who are clearly expert in this area. Um, personally, my view is it needs that we need, I need time to digest it. And, and, and you know, the margins look thin. Uh, the period is 20 years, um, and, and uh, I, I really just need to understand the variables a little bit better, but I'll pass it on to John and uh, let him opine. Mr. Jeffrey? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, just so uh, how much time do we, to, to, to address Bob's question, how much time do we have to be able to safely secure block number four? Because it, it appears, in, and if my memory serves me correct, if we went back to blocks three, two, and one, blocks, obviously block one and two, I recall having a very significant advantage. And it appears to me from my notes and from what I read in preparation for this, this evening, when you look at the, uh, the, the blocks, it's not a linear increase, but it's about a 5% per block total cost. Jess, is that about correct? So that sounds right to me. I, I will say that Beth, I think, is probably better equipped to answer that particular question. Beth, do you have thoughts on that? Yeah, sure. Um, so under the SMART program, with each decline from block to block, there's a 4% decline. 
4%. Okay. So, um, thank you. That, that's, uh, so 4% in what I was getting to, Beth, is given the cost of money is very inexpensive at this point in time, and given the fact that you don't know what the increases will be in the utility rates, it would seem to be at our advantage to move forward with this because we can do it either way at a very, at a relatively lower cost today than we would tomorrow, given just on what we know about the block and the block process. So I, it, in my math, and I'm sure Robin will correct my math, but in, in my math, it seems that the, the additional cost to us, while it's not insignificant, is certainly a much better use of our money today than it would be by waiting a year from now. And that would be my, my immediate thought, number one. And number two is that there would be a, that would, there would definitely be a, a cost advantage in the process to using the contractor so there'd be continuity rather than as you refer to it, there may be some incremental differences by using different contractors. Robert? You know, so I view this in two ways. One as a hedge against increases in energy costs. And the second is more of a feel good type um, thing because, you know, it, we're demonstrating that we're trying to reduce our carbon footprint, even though it's, it's, it's very small for this particular um, I do agree. I think, you know, the piece that's missing here is what would it cost us to replace the roof versus, you know, using the sealant for $85,000 that, ex that extends the life by 20 years, because that is potentially also a savings. Uh, I, you know, to make a decision tonight, I really haven't had a lot of time to look through the numbers. So I don't feel as though I, I am equipped to make a decision tonight. I could certainly come back much better informed at our next meeting. You know, I would, I would lean towards doing this because it would make me feel good, but I'm not sure that's the right reason to do it. You know, I, um, I, I recognize that this is a small project in Dover, but, you know, every project starts with a brick and this would be a small brick towards savings. So, and reducing the carbon footprint, which, which really is a goal of the board of selectmen and the town of Dover. So those, the, those are those are my comments. I I I don't feel like I've really given this enough time to make a decision tonight. Okay. You know, I, I recognize, you know, especially if we're in block five and with the roof, it, it looks like the financial benefits are really very small. Uh, but so that's why I do think we should add in, you know, the, the differential between replacing the roof and um, the sealant, just so that we could see what that might be. Okay. And as you can see, I'm all over the place. Yeah. Well, yeah, this is like, and I, and I, I mean, the, the, uh, the folks have given us an awful lot of information um, and, and, and options. So I would, I would just defer a decision until the next meeting. And I, I think that's the 23rd. And Beth, what, what does that mean in terms of our ability to get into the, the block floor? So when the, the <clears throat> excuse me, the second phase of the SMART program launched in mid-April, there was a suspension of the program immediately after the regulations were filed for the vendor to sort of prepare the, the portals. When they opened up the portal, 
for new applications, it's my understanding they got a significant amount of interest. The other thing that the state did when they launched their second phase of SMART is they created some additional carve outs for smaller projects. And once you achieve, once that carve out is, is achieved, you move to the next block. So there could be, again, depending on the delay, it's unclear because there's no real transparency. At this point, it's unclear how much of the additional capacity in, we know we're in block four. Um, it's not ex transparent yet how many applications are actually been accepted um, in block four and how much capacity is left in block four. I can try to see if I can do some additional research and get back to you on that. See if the if DOER or the vendor will share that with us. Um, but I think we're in a good position to be in either block four or block five. Um, there are some other things that are still pending that could improve the economics. But for now, I think, you know, Select has relied on everything that, that um, has been published under the emergency regulations. Thank you. I, uh, I also think that it seems to me that the, the variable is the condition of the roof and the expense related to the roof. And I'd certainly like to get a better handle on that. I mean, a 20 year rubber roof um, with a five year leak guarantee seems, um, I just need more, I just need more work. To, I just um, need more work. Bob, when, when Capital and Onsite Insight uh, came to us and did the assessments of the high school roof and the middle school roof, was the town garage roof in, in part of the process? No. Uh, that was, um, the, I, I, no, not, I, I, well, I shouldn't say that um, because I'm, I'm basically going back to what they did around Carroll. So I don't know what the scope of the, uh, I don't remember what the scope of the additional work was. Um, Robin, do you? I'm assuming the roof was part of the uh, capital needs assessment if we did one for the town garage, but I don't remember if we did. I think yeah. we did for the town garage and for the town and for the town house, and uh, we did not include Carol, um, but we did did include the my recollections we included. So I think that would be good, that'd be a good piece of data to to know because uh, it it is my memory serves me correct. It's the roof for the town garage is was has not been on our on our to do list for the is not on our to do list for the next couple of years. I think adding this level of of life to that roof actually may be a significant savings to us in the long. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So that's that was Right. Sorry, <laughs> oh, completely. That's what I was trying to say. You know, it we we shouldn't discount this for for that savings. But you know, at this point, I I didn't have time to go back and look to see how you know how old that roof is. Yeah. Just just what what would you need from as a commitment if we can get back to you and and Beth. By our next meeting, what do you need us to do at that time? So I think that this has been tremendously helpful to sort of see the boards thinking about this and, and we can provide and I can um, work with, with DPW and the town manager's office to get the information that the board needs to sort of make this decision. Um, at this point, I think the most important item would be the letter of intent and the letter of intent sort of has embedded within it, uh, or we, that we'd want to know what sort of which option, you know, rolling it into the rest of the roof price, the town doing the work itself, or some other third option, um, in order to to figure out how to proceed with that letter of intent. So, if I, I what I'd like to do, what I hope we can do is to sort of take this feedback, which I think has been all very helpful gather the information that the board has has raised uh, that it wants to review tonight and then present it you know quickly enough so that the board has has time to digest everything and then hopefully uh, review further at the next meeting. Robin That sounds like an excellent plan. John agreed. Okay. Ladies it's thank good. you very much. Well done. Appreciate thank it. Thank you very much for your time this evening. We, we greatly appreciate it and we'll talk to you on the 23rd. Super.
Thank you. If not sooner, we're, we could have all sooner. sorts of meetings. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much. Have a good evening, everybody. You too. Good night. Thank you. Thanks, Beth. Uh, item 1.4 is goals and objectives discussion. Um, I think this is simply really around how we want to proceed um, with setting up meetings so that we can go through um, what we proposed to do last year, where we are now, and, and how does the world look to us um, in the summer of 2020, and, and how do we want to attack the goals and prioritization of goals for fiscal year 21. I think that's right. Again, I get some nods. Okay. Um, so, John, to start with I, you. I, I would very much like to do two meetings the way we did last year. I'd, I'd like to have uh, focused meetings that um, people can attend and, and we can we can we can propose our, our we can publish our agenda and people can make comments. It's not. Uh, it, it's. I found last year it was extremely helpful to be able to get feedback from some of the subgroups and within the townhouse and outside of the townhouse for what we were thinking and what they were thinking so we could we could have the planning meetings and then coalesce with the um, with the groups i found it to be very collaborative and extremely uh, uh, important because a lot of the people in those departments were new and i think it's going to be very helpful for people like kathy and david and kate <laughs> who are with us tonight to be able to weigh in on this for the first time. So uh, I think you, you had proposed the process that suggested that we, we go through the exercise, whether it's one or two meetings. We, we should be really efficient because we did it last year was the first time we did it in two meetings. So this time we probably could do it in like a half hour. And, um, you know, get put together sort of our thoughts and prioritization of thought, then we're gonna syndicate the information. And and um, and then probably re get together and 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 then set final priorities. Is my memory right, Robin? Please help me. Right. So you know, and I think I think this year, last year we didn't have a framework, so we okay. created a framework, and this year we have a framework. And Chris took that framework and um, set it up with the priorities. So I think that's certainly the starting point. And then we, we should go back and say, um, are, is there anything that's missing that we need to add? And then identify what the priorities are for the coming 12 months. Because, you know, I think all the buckets are still the, the items we, we want to address. We can just move forward on, on some of the programs because we did make a tremendous amount of progress. And also keep in mind that neither Kate nor Chris nor Dave were well, here I, last year when we yeah. set the goals. So I think it will be really useful and helpful to have them participate <laughs> in, that, in that meeting since they are the ones that, you know, We'll be pulling on the oars. <laughs> right. And, and, you know, looking at Kathy, so much work, which was a goal, has been done on the finance team. So I, I do think it's important to take what we created. Um, you know, if there, if there are improvements we can make, let's do that. And then, you know, I thought what we did an excellent job of last year was we did a good job prioritizing so the goals were achievable and nobody was overwhelmed. And, and I think we want to do the same thing again this, this year. Because, yeah. You know, I think we were ambitious, but we, they were achievable. Yeah, I, th I, uh, I, I do think that um, we handled the critical items last year and we handled it with COVID and that was quite an achievement. Um, and we do have to worry about, you know, we don't we want to get the right amount, the most important things done. And we don't want to overload. We don't want to just have our talents dispersed among too many things. Right. And John, didn't we have like a really good person who facilitated the meeting last year? <laughs> don't you think? Don't you think that person should facilitate the meeting this year? What do you think? Facilitator. You. <laughs> <laughs> she, she had the she had the papers. She had the 
marker. Well, this, this, year, this year could be even easier. I can do it electronically. Electronically, <laughs> right. I brought in the big giant sticky notes last year. Right. Up on the walls. Right. So one of the questions is, should we do it physically together? I don't know. I think that I think it's very tricky because I don't know if it abides by the state regulations. It would be really hard to be six feet apart. And I know from a, a professional standpoint, like we basically said, all collaboration has to be done electronically. So we should probably talk to the, you know, to the to the to the team and see what makes the most sense. Okay, because certainly um, we've demonstrated that we can handle an outdoor meeting with close to 50 people. Um, right, I guess we could do it outdoor. Yeah, I would, I would well, there, there, when I was thinking about this, and, and the only reason why I'm doing this is because, it, the, because of last year, there was, a, there was a dynamic element to the process, and it was yeah. very interactive. And um, the, the only thing is, we'll we'll have to have rain dates. <laughs> <laughs> you will. You have so much outfits. You were set up for for the floods at the town meeting. I was um, prepared, <laughs> and I needed to be prepared. I had an umbrella with a hole in it. It was <laughs> didn't work. Um, so so we probably have four or five people. Um, and the idea would be if we did it outside, you just set up like, like we were sitting at table. Right, right. So you could do it that way. If, if, um, if you had to do it or wanted to consider an option around indoors, then you'd need a, high, you'd need a big space that was well ventilated. And right. And we certainly and prefer the outdoors. No, I think the only way I would feel comfortable doing it is, would be outdoors. Okay, so we could work that out, and and uh, you know, from the space point of view, is there a place? Is there a playground or something over by Carol that would that would could be suitable? We could do it in front in the town green. Well, we could we could make it a picnic. We could. Okay, so we'll we'll, um, we'll sort of work go over Delhi. We could pick up. A food. <laughs> it would be very convenient. You know, as the new member of the board, you have to buy coffee and cookies and donuts. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we'll sort of plan that way. How about dates? You guys, last time we did it like Friday mornings, I believe. You, does that work for you guys? Yeah, that probably works the best for me. Yeah, I think we did Thursday mornings and Friday mornings. And, yeah. uh, it's just and because so if, we do, if we do next Friday and the um, the subsequent Friday, give that would be get us get us probably get us done in July. So you mean that? Are you talking about the seventeenth and twenty fourth or the tenth? Seventeenth and twenty fourth. I don't think we'd be able to set up for the tenth. I can do that. I do have a standing eleven thirty a.m. meeting. That I need to attend. Okay. We'll be done before. Robin, you're up at five. We can start this at six. Right, we could. <laughs> so we could do eight o'clock on, on eight o'clock start on, on Friday the 17th. Is, right. that, uh, is that right? That works for me. John? Yes. And then the, the we have a, our normal meeting the 23rd at 6 30. Right. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, excuse me, that meeting is the 22nd, July 22nd, Wednesday. Thank Why you. Why did you on Wednesday? Because no. you said, Bob, you needed four-day weekends, and <laughs> now you need to do Friday meeting. That's so right. I'm just, like, really confused. <laughs> I'm going to do a danger field. I, don't, I get no respect. <laughs> And I would just like to say something, if I might. Robin, you did a wonderful job last year with all the papers taped up to the wall. She had <laughs> colored markers, and it was very nicely done and organized. <laughs> so That's why John nominated her. <laughs> I completely forgot that I did that. <laughs> yeah, yes, you did a great job. <laughs> I always go for the talent, you know? Yes. That's, that's what you want. Mona, I still have those big sticky notes. I have 
Well, maybe Carl Warner can put something up on the lawn for us so we can take them up again. <laughs> That's a great idea. Just, right. So I meant, on the opening, I really meant to, to express my gratitude, the gratitude of the board to all the people who made town meeting happen on the 29th. Um, it was just a, a colossal team effort. Um, and and um, the fact that we got it in was a miracle because somehow somebody kept those thunderstorms and rain just far enough away for us to finish that meeting. So again, my heartfelt gratitude for all, all the work that was done. I think it was Chief McGowan. <laughs> they were afraid of him. <laughs> They ran away. <laughs> Agree. <laughs> totally. Said, so, um, I think we can move on, yes? Yes. yes. Okay. Um, hey, Mona, you're going to send me the dates we agreed to, right? So I remember? Will do. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Item 1-5, award bid for replacement of roofing at the Protective Agencies building. Kate and Carl? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so tonight I'm going to ask uh, the board to award the roof replacement at the Protective Agency Building bid to one-way painting and roofing. Um, we received 11 bids. Wow. And they uh, were the lowest responsible bidder and they came in at $108,000. Uh, um, Carl Warnack checked the references um, and they were all great. Um, and they all came, they came highly regarded, so. And they, they were also uh, the housing authorities. So public bidding was good. Thank you, Carl. Uh, <clears throat> John, any questions? When will it begin, Carl? We need to make a motion first and vote it. Can <laughs> make any can begin? Yeah, it can't begin before that. Good point. All right, so um, may I have a motion? I make a motion to award the bid for roof replacement at the Protective Agencies Building to One Way Painting and Roofing of Lynn, Massachusetts. Seconded, John Jeffries. All in favor? Voice vote. Aye, Robin Hunter. Aye, Bob Spain. Aye, John Jeffries. You have a question now, John? <laughs> Carl, when do you think they would begin the project? Well, once we get all the paperwork in order, their insurance certificates and so on and so forth, I would have to say in the next two to three weeks maximum, they're okay. ready to go. So, Mr. Chair, can I ask Carl another question, which is on the topic that we've already covered, just a real quick? Sure. Carl, I don't know if you were on the phone, and I apologize if you heard this part, but I'd ask Colonial Water about notifying you when the alarms go off and they said that it was a it, it they do it by phone have we ever looked into something where they could notify you directly in, in that you would have access to the notification system uh no to the notification system my issue with colonial is is i hear about it four or five days later and they have my cell phone number I'm available 24 7. Yeah, I, I that that's sort of where I was going with the question. So, I, yeah, uh, did, I'm sorry, Carl. What'd you say? I said yes. It's it's they need to notify me if there's any issues with the water system in the town. Okay, so and can I, you I, 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 sorry, Carl. That's all right, Kate. Can, uh, we need to we need to get in contact with Colonial and just say they need to make sure, we need a better way of making sure Carl's involved. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Uh, okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Sorry, I, I I just thought that was worthwhile with Carl here, and I just didn't want to let that slip by. No, good. No, I, you know, when people when we hear one thing, we need to make sure that we close the loop on a lot of this stuff. Um, yeah. And it's unfortunate, but it's just good management practice. You know what I mean? Okay, so we have agenda item 1.6, approved fiscal year 20 year-end budget appropriation transfers. 
Kathy LaPlante. Ah, I got it. Um, <laughs> good evening. I'm Kathy LaPlante, your town accountant. Um, and we have um, only two um, appropriation transfers. Um, for those that don't know, um, during the month of May, June, and up to July 15th, the town um, under Mass General Law can transfer money that was voted at town meeting from one budget to another, from salaries to expenses, but it can only be approved by the Board of Selectmen and the Warrant Committee. And it's only between that period of time. Um, the Warrant Committee is going to be meeting on the 15th of July, which is the drop dead last date. So um, hopefully no hurricanes, no nothing happens on that day. Um, so again, you have two in front of you. The first one is um, from Parks and Recreation. Basically, um, he's looking to transfer $30,000 from uh, the full-time salary account down to the grounds maintenance account. Um, this is due uh, to the fact uh, he needed to use a vendor um, due to staff shortages. One staff member had resigned, uh, I mean, was out on an injury, and another position was vacant. Um, so he did not have um, the staff to um, take care of the grounds. So had to hire a vendor, and that's why the 30000 is available in the salary and is requested to move down expenses. So do you want us to vote each item? Um, you, want to you can vote. It's totally up to you. You can vote bottom line. I, I didn't. It, the reason I say this is because um, if there's – if you want to vote one and not the other one or you know what I'm saying so either way it's there's only two so if you like I could just talk about the second one and we can vote the whole thing at once yeah go ahead Kathy okay um Janet is here to speak to um in case um I missed something but um in Janet's situation in the counts on aging um there are additional funds in the um I'm sorry, in the, I'm just trying to book here. Um, there are additional funds in her expense accounts due to the fact that a lot of her programs and um, functions, anything that was planned to do because of COVID didn't happen. So those funds are still available. Um, and the reason they're needed in the full-time salary account is um, at the beginning of fiscal 20, when Janet was reclassified and became um salaried employee with a higher pay, um, that was done after the budget was set. So that's why the budget is short. So the, the for, um, for Janet, it would be transferring those um, different funds. She has uh, four different line items with available funds that we can move up to salaries to cover the deficit. Okay. That's it, that's what I got. We need Great. to approve the total of that? You have to approve just each one. You know that you approve the recreation transfer of thirty thousand dollars, and you can approve. You could just do it in a summary, and then approve the transfer of eighty eighty six hundred dollars for the council on aging. All right. So, the, so the motion I have is uh, I move to approve the appropriation transfers as presented. Do okay, I need to do more? No, that, that works. Uh, you know, because I know that what's presented becomes part of your minutes and part of all that stuff. So that's fine. Okay, I need a second. John Jeffrey, second. All in favor say. Aye, Robin Hunter. Aye, Bob Springett. Aye, John Jeffries. Done. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you, Janet. Is there anything anyone needs me for? Dinner? I've been eating a 15 minutes, so they're starving and they're ready to faint. So, no, you know. you're excused. I think yeah. actually, the rest of the agenda yeah. is pretty straightforward, actually. Thank you. Thank you. Have a nice evening. Thank you very much. If you need me, have a great evening. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Kathy. Bye. So, Thank we'll you. We move on to item 1.7 appointments. So um, the recycling committee is recommending that the board reappoint Wendy Mullers to the recycling committee for a three-year term effective July 1st, 2020, and ending on June 30th, 2023. Uh, Building Inspector Walter Avalone is recommending that the board appoint James Murphy as the second alternate wiring inspector 
for a one-year term effective July 1st, 2020, and ending on July, June 30th, 2021. So I move to appoint Wendy Mullers. Is it Mullers? Uh, I move to appoint Wendy Mullers to the Recycling Committee for a three-year term effective July 1st, 2020, and ending on June 30th, 2023. Seconded, John Jeffries. All in favor? Aye, Robin Hunter. Aye, Bob Springett. Aye, John Jeffries. Um, I move to appoint James Murphy as the second alternate wiring inspector for a one-year term effective July 1st, 2020, and ending on June 30th, 2021. Second. All in favor? Aye, John Jeffries. Aye, Robin Hunter. Aye, Bob Smith. Done. Thank you. Item 1.8, Board of Selectmen updates. Um, I'm going to do just a couple of things that I'm aware of and um, that's going on. Um, on the uh, Carroll, Carroll Building Committee, um, the committee is in the process of reviewing, I think it's 15 applications from architects um, uh, to take on the project. Uh, that review process is going on now, and uh, they're going to be. There's going to be a meeting on Monday to start the pair, you know, review and interview, et cetera, et cetera, and pair um, uh, the list down to, I guess, the final two or three. I'm not quite sure. So um, even in the background, even with COVID, the Carroll Building Committee continues to uh, move ahead, which is encouraging for me and uh, and and. Uh, I know they're putting in a lot, lot of time. So that's moving on. Um, on the COVID-19 uh, task force, um, we have, it's been touch wood, COVID's been pretty stable. We have um, migrated from weekly meetings to bi-weekly meetings. Um, and on the, on, the weekend, on the weeks when we're not meeting uh, via Zoom, uh, people who attend the meeting are sending updates um, to Chris or, or to Kate so that we can continue to give weekly updates to the community on what's on, on what's been going on. Um, and again, it, it seemed that all seems to be, that was agreed by all the participants at the, at the meeting and, um, you know, things seem to be working there well. And then I'm personally happy that the Technology Advisory Board is going to restart um, and their meeting is scheduled for Tuesday next week. Um, and I think, it's, I think it's a good time because um, we have a lot to report on status for the various and sundry projects that have literally taken place during the COVID period. And it'd be good to get their input, I think, on sort of next steps for, for the town technology wise. Um, and so we'll see where that goes. So those are the three things that projects that I know are going on, um, you know, other than the normal day-to-day -day stuff and E. coli and, and, and the other things. Um, so I don't know, Robin or John, if you have any particular item that you're aware of that's worth, worth mentioning here in this update section? I just will, um, thank you, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I will say that I, I got very good feedback from a number of, of our citizens who as we were talking about with the water issue, um, they were very they were very happy at the rate of improvement in the process from beginning to the resolution. And I don't think anybody was happy that it happened. I think that for the most part, people showed great resolve. They showed um, patience and understanding. And the feedback that I got was that they were they were very happy with the rate of change and the way it was handled and how it was implemented from the beginning to the end of this process. Well, that's good to know. That really is. I was really happy that uh, Eric Modell was able to join a number of those meetings. He, 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 he just came across as a, a very professional individual and, and well, well informed. I thought that to was. To I was able to give you know, really good answers to, to a lot of the questions that people had. 
And, you know, it was good to have an independent third party giving those answers rather than colonial. Couldn't agree more. Couldn't agree more. Robin, do you have any other? I don't have anything. I wonder what I've been doing with all my free time. I'm going to give you one. There was this Department of Revenue review of, of our financial area. And at some point, I'd like to hear what the heck happened. I think we're still waiting for the final report. Okay. Okay. And I'm sure it was delayed because of COVID. But when I'm not getting to be a tiresome excuse. I, I don't know. Right. So okay. I'm going to use that as my excuse and I'm sticking with it. <laughs> <laughs> Any comments on the upcoming agendas? Which, which ones? We have so many. Three. I told John, Robin, that I'm going for the world's record on meetings this summer. And if they're by Zoom, I'm okay with it. Yeah, he's been Because I can Zoom out. from the beach, I can Zoom from my house. See, I changed my room today. Yeah, I I'm impressed. I'm, I'm, I'm definitely impressed. All right. <laughs> yeah. no, the bottle, the bottle. Rio, Rio just made a motion to adjourn. <laughs> <laughs> Wait a minute. We have, we have one more item, I believe. Maybe... Two. Oh, two. Yep. Okay. This is the last item. Um, town administrator update. Assistant. One Kate? Yes, thank you. Um, so I feel pretty safe speaking on behalf of Chris as well and just thanking our team for that sprint uh, of getting to town meeting um, on that stormy day. Um, there was just so much hard work put into it by by everyone. So I just wanted to, to thank everyone. Um, special shout out to uh, the town clerk, Felicia Huffman, who uh, I, I think someone made a comment on Facebook about seeing her car um, there in the parking lot on weekends. Um, right. So yeah. th that was true. She worked night and weekends to prepare for this. Last minute changes, all the logistics, working with the vendors. Um, so, and I know Mona was there one Sunday as well. So just just wanted to thank our entire team. And then the web and, didn't cooperate. I, no. yeah, was just, I kept saying, please talk faster, please talk faster, please talk faster. So John, you may, you, so as a sailor, I'm watching the sky and I'm mumbling <laughs> in the middle, but you got three minutes, you got three minutes. <laughs> exactly. Kate, I've got, I took unbelievable photos that, that I think I've shared with, with several people, but they, they are unbelievable when you see how dark it is all around us. Right. And, and you, it's, a, it's really, they're classic because of the social distancing aspect. I got Felicia and Dave Haviland in the same, same shot when, when Jim Repetti is at the stand. The chief is in the background all the members of Warrant, and behind them, the sky is just <laughs> So it really is, thanks, thanks, Kate, well, very well said. And I just wanted to know for the record, how does it feel to be the town administrator in, in the absence of Chris for the week? You know, it's, it's been smooth sailing. I'm not sure what, what he's talking about. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, it's, it's been, <laughs> luckily the team is set up. We have such a great team that it just, it works so well. So. It's so, been a good um, week so far, knock on wood. It's a yeah, yeah. Nice day, but. <laughs> so I'm pretty much on time. This, this last item, 1.9, was supposed to start at 7.50. So I'm going to give Dave Sullivan two minutes to tell us what he's doing on document storage and retrieval. Sure, I can work with, help you on that. Uh, so with document storage and retrieval, I have been going up to that attic. And uh, what I have created is a um, actual document inventory, which I built on Google Sheets, which uh, gives you all the information. And I also put in a little bit um, math on that to see how many sheets per box. So we can kind of get somewhat of an idea on what we would need to uh, get for storage bins to uh, with Iron Mountain or a vendor like that uh, to get it out of here and shredded. Uh, I've worked with Felicia and we've discussed with the Secretary of State what the retention rules would be around a lot of it. Uh, from what I can see, a lot of it will be able to be uh, shredded. It's past its retention date, so that's uh, good news on that aspect. 
Uh, what we were also looking at from the front end is I've been going around and working with the departments uh, and looking at all the PDFs that they've brought on to the new website and looking to see what I can take and make a fillable PDF. And from that fillable PDF, then we can hopefully store them electronically rather than have the paper. So even if somebody does print out the uh, fillable PDF, we can still take that scan it and it'll be machine readable for OCR in the future as well. So uh, just kind of uh, some, some baby steps on making sure we're getting rid of the paper that can be getting rid of uh, and anything new coming in in the future will be handled electronically. And then starting to look at what we can do with our storage, whether it's our on-prem server or if we can use um, Google uh, shared drives uh, which then would give us the ability to access these documents anywhere, especially in this time of COVID, which is uh, important to have uh, better access to uh, documents from different locations. So did I go over my two minutes or I was trying yeah, to- you're about there. I was just going to start. Here's the big question that everybody's on everybody's mind. Are you in the attic now? I am not. <laughs> <laughs> I have a uh, very soft lighting and there's one <laughs> overhead light that I didn't turn on. So, just keep that way. Sorry, I couldn't resist. <laughs> we we let him out at night at five o'clock. <laughs> Thank you, Dave. Janet, I haven't talked to you in a long time. Do you have anything you want to add? <laughs> well, I'm not in the attic. <laughs> oh, it looks uh, nice and bright wherever you are, Janet. At home in the kitchen, isn't that nice? <laughs> Um, the Council on Aging, one of the things we started last week, which we're going to be doing every two weeks, is we now have a grant from Beth Israel Deaconess Hospital, as well as matching uh, grant funds from the Trustees of Reservation, and we are accessing wholesale pr produce from Powisset Farm. So every two weeks on a Thursday afternoon from 2 to 3.30, we are going to, ha we have a drive-through pickup where you can come in and as a senior drive-through, we have a display of vegetables with uh, volunteers and staff there to pack them up for you. And we also have our bread donated from Blue Moon Bagel Cafe that day. And last week we even had hand sanitizer and other things to hand out. So people drive up and they uh, have things put right in their car, contactless. And um, it was a nice way to get fresh vegetables to seniors. We contacted a lot of them to see if they would like to have it delivered because there's many that I thought they're not gonna leave their homes, but only two uh, said they would like a delivery. The rest wanted to get out. Um, Thank you so really. It worked out well. It kind of came in through the back of Carol and kind of drove in, stopped, put stuff in their car, said hello, everybody wearing masks and went on their way. So it was a, it was a, it was a good start. We'll be doing that every two weeks um, through October. Terrific. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Well done. Okay, so now I, maybe we should entertain a motion to adjourn. Are you guys interested or you wanna keep going? I move to adjourn. I'll second. All in favor? Aye, Robin. Bob Strand. <laughs> Aye, Robin Hunter. Aye, uh, John Jeffries. Thank you all uh, for participating. Um, today is Wednesday, so I still wish you have a good weekend, but I still think there's a tropical storm off the coast. You need to be careful if you're out there selling. Yes, you will. Kate, good job. Good job. Very well done. Good night, guys. Thank you. Ladies. <laughs> well done. Good night. Good night. Good night.